And again, we're looking at issues of importance to the South Caucasus. Today, we have Mr. David J. Kramer, Director of European and Eurasian Studies, and a senior fellow at the Vaclav Havel Center for Human Rights and Diplomacy at Florida International University, Stephen J. Green School of International Public Affairs. He was also the former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor for the George W. Bush administration. Welcome, Mr. Kramer. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. So let's get right into this, talking a little bit about our new president. Um, at the Munich Security Conference last week, President Biden repeated that America is back. There was a great deal of discussion about the shared commitment to the European Union in climate policy and concerns about threats from Russia. What does America being back mean for the South Caucasus? I, I think it means that there will be much more engagement with the three countries in the region. Um, I think it also will mean that there will be more pushback against uh, the Putin regime in Moscow. And I think that's important for uh, the three countries in the South Caucasus as well. Uh, we, we didn't see much engagement from the Trump administration in the region. Uh, Vice President Pence, I will say, did visit Georgia in the summer of 2017. Um, Secretary Pompeo then traveled to Georgia uh, last November, but I actually uh, was quite critical of his visit and the timing of his visit because it came between two rounds of their parliamentary elections. And frankly, I don't think he helped the situation much at all. Um, I, I think the United States in, uh, has, has been quite absent uh, when it comes to dealing with the conflict and problems between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I hope that that will change as well. So I, I think we'll see a more engaged approach by the Biden administration. But, but just as importantly, I think, we will see the United States working more closely with our European allies in the region too. And transatlantic relations, I think, became very frayed during the Trump years. And I think President Biden is keenly interested in repairing those relations. He's gonna face some challenges with uh, some of our European allies, including Germany over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, dealings with China. But when it comes to the South Caucasus, I hope the United States and Europe can, can work together. Well, that sounds like good news for this region, if the United States is engaged. I, I think it is good news, but the, the, the region is posing some real challenges and problems exactly. for, for the countries themselves, as well as for the rest of us. Absolutely. And, and speaking of that, in Armenia, uh, the Prime Minister Pashinya uh, has been under a great deal of duress since the November 9th ceasefire against uh, the people have been unhappy with him. And now it seems like yesterday he warned there was an attempted military coup in Armenia. He sacked the commander of the armed forces. Now, U.S. and Turkey already condemned this coup, and, but Russia called it a domestic matter. How would you characterize these events happening in Armenia right now? Well, uh, Pashinyan, of course, came came to power through a revolution, uh, replacing Sarkisian, and um, I think did offer some hope for Armenia um, after what had been really a, a rule of corruption and increasing authoritarianism under Sarkisian. So uh, Pashinyan came in with great hope, um, but what really changed things in particular were the events of last fall with the uh, resumption of hostilities and, and frankly, um, conflict, if not outright war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, there has been gr uh, really growing criticism of Pashinyan's handling of, of that situation, of the agreement that he basically was forced to sign uh, with Russian intervention. Um, and it also has meant the uh, presence, really for the first time in many years, of Russian peacekeeping forces on what now is considered Azerbaijani territory. And uh, so, so he is, Pashinyan is facing a tremendous blowback and criticism for his handling of this. And there had been growing uh, concern about what was happening there in, in the country anyway. So it, it'll, it'll be a, a difficult situation for them to, to sort out. Um, and, and, and you're right that he's facing growing protests in the country. Um, and I, I, it's not clear to me 
um, how this is going to play out because there continue to be demonstrations against against his leadership. And what I think the United States needs to do is to support a peaceful process. People certainly have the right to protest peacefully. Um, the, the military and security forces should avoid any, any violent uh, crackdown. Um, and also, while Russia may claim that this is a domestic affair, uh, Mr. Putin has shown a, a growing tendency to interfere in other countries' uh, domestic politics. And I would expect, given the importance of Russian-Armenian ties, that Russia will not sit idly by. So not sitting idly by, is do you see Russia wanting to replace Pashinya? Is, is that what their ultimate puppet master idea might be? I don't, I don't know that they want him replaced unless they had someone they were comfortable with to replace him with. But um, in, in general, Mr. Putin does not like the removal of leaders through popular movements. He doesn't like it. He didn't like it in the color revolutions in 2003 and four and five in, in uh, Georgia, Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan. Um, he doesn't like it in the Middle East, even um, with the events of what happened in 2011, Libya in particular. Um, and he doesn't like it in Belarus, where there have been growing protests um, against the Lukashenko dictatorship. And, and we certainly uh, saw that he was unhappy with Yanukovych's uh, uh, fleeing from power, and that then precipitated Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So in general, Mr. Putin does not like to see um, lead like-minded leaders, and I'm not saying Pashinyan is a like-minded leader with Putin, but he doesn't like to see leaders, particularly in his neighborhood, being driven from power. So I'm not sure that he uh, is all that comfortable. At the same time, I think he may like the fact that Armenia is quite bogged down with these protests, with this controversy, because he also, I think, has some concerns that Pashinyan might have been interested in moving more closely toward the Euro-Atlantic community. And if these kinds of, of protests and the criticism of his leadership uh, prevent him from moving in that direction, that's something I think Mr. Putin would, would want. But you wouldn't call Pashinyan, Pashinyan a, a popular leader at this point, would you? Uh, he's not a popular leader at this point. He was um, several years ago when he came into power. Um, and um, I would say, no, he's, he's not a popular leader right now. It seems like the general sentiment is shifting against him and his leadership. But uh, no, I, I, I don't think anyone could describe him as a popular leader. But you, at the same time, you don't see anybody coming to mind that Russia might like to replace him with. Well, the former prime minister is is come into play um, as a possibility. Um, it, it's not clear. Uh, I, I also think Russia has to be careful about trying to orchestrate a leadership change because if the population views a replacement uh, 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 Pashinyan as a Russian puppet, um, that won't go over well either. Uh, Putin has has a concern that he has to be increasingly aware of. And that is about um, uh, alienating populations in these countries um, by uh, being too heavy handed, whether it's through outright intervention or other kinds of, uh, of measures. And so he risks alienating, whether it's in Belarus or in Armenia, um, alienating the populations in these countries. Countries, by the way, you know, in the case of Belarus, it's not anti-Russian at all. In the case of Armenia, it has been very dependent on Russia for its security um, and, and development. So um, I, I think Putin needs to be very careful about how he, how he handles this situation. The concern might be in Azerbaijan that if Pashinya is replaced, there might be more aggression toward Azerbaijan, as a result, a, a new prime minister might say, well, the reason I'm replacing him is because we need to go back and fix what he left behind in, in Karawak. That, that's right. That's right. And I, I think there is concern um, that if he were replaced, that it, exactly as you put it, Joanne, that, that um, the feeling is that he did not handle the conflict well at all. He did not stand up for Armenia's interests. And so there is a, a feeling uh, among some, perhaps, that they will want to reopen the whole situation, which I think would be disastrous. It was it was bad for both countries and, and most uh, specifically for the people in the region. 
And so I, w- I would certainly hope we don't see a flare up in, in fighting if there is a leadership change. Reopening this whole conflict, that's not going to end well for anyone. And it could lead to even more Russian and Turkish intervention. So um, that also would not be good for anyone. You talked a little bit about the Russian peacekeepers in Karabakh, um, and now they've escalated from the ceasefire agreement, which said fewer than 2,000 to as many as 5,000. And the Russians are moving bases closer to the Azerbaijani border. What does this expansion of Russian forces in the Karabakh region mean for the uh, the whole region, the region as a whole? It means Russia now has a presence in all three countries. Um, it only only in really two, I guess you could say, is it invited. In the case of Georgia, obviously there are Russian occupying forces uh, that that take up 20% of Georgian territory. Georgia, of course, is asked. Uh, or demanded even that those forces leave following the 2008 invasion of, of, of Georgia by Russian forces. In the case of Armenia, they're invited. There's a base there. Um, Russia, Russia's presence is, is in fact uh, desired by, by the uh, Armenian population and by the Armenian leadership. In the case of Azerbaijan now, there is um, uh, close to 2,000 Russian peacekeepers. Um, that are monitoring the the situation and trying to prevent a flare up in the conflict, um, and so uh, yeah, some some people speculate that that this makes Putin very happy that he now has troops on the ground in all three. Um, I'm not sure having these peacekeepers sitting there is all that desirable. It does give him some greater influence over the situation with Azerbaijan. But I, I'm not sure that uh, should there be a flare up, should, for example, there be a change in leadership in Armenia that could lead to a, a resumption of fighting, that that's something Putin wants to see. Well, I, I know that the Russians are giving the, the Armenian the people that are coming back resettling, they are giving them Russian passports. Um, what does that suggest to you? Well, I mean, passportization, um, a, a term that has been used to describe Russian efforts, not just in this region, but with in Moldova, with Transnistria, and Crimea, um, and, and elsewhere, it is not a new phenomenon when it comes to the current Russian leadership, a leadership, by the way, that's been in power for 20 years plus. Um, and, and so this is an effort, I think, to expand its influence by uh, enabling people in the region to travel to Russia. Um, Armenia is very dependent on Russia for economic support and aid, um, including remittances that come back from Armenian laborers um, in Russia. So um, a lot of this, I think, is simply to uh, try different means and methods uh, to improve Russia's standing in the region. Um, to show that it isn't just hard power that they use, but also these kind of uh, more sharp power rather than soft power, but sharp power uh, efforts to increase its influence. Um, Let's um, turn a little bit more to Georgia. You mentioned a couple of things about Georgia, but there's been more recently, there have been protests in Georgia. The main opposition leader was arrested. Um, human rights champions say this is possibly a real step back for democracy in Georgia, um, where there was so much promise, even a possible seat in the EU or NATO. How do you characterize this, these latest events? Um, Georgia's in a crisis. Uh, it's, it's in one of its most critical uh, points right now. And we have a situation where um, the ruling party, Georgian Dream, um, raided the headquarters of the main opposition party, um, the UNM, United National Movement, and arrested the leader of UNM, Nick Amelia. Um, this has really put things at a boiling point. And, and so I'm very concerned about what hap- what's, could happen in Georgia. Um, I think the, the uh, 
the fact that there is very cold weather right now in Tbilisi has kept some of the crowds that might have turned out down from what they would have been. Um, but uh, th there are calls for a major demonstration this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly hope we will not see a violent crackdown by uh, police and security forces against people, and I hope they will remain peaceful. Um, there's responsibility here on both sides. But I do think the bulk of the responsibility for the current crisis um, lies not entirely, but mostly with Georgian Dream, with the party in power, and, and with the person who is pulling the strings behind the scenes, and that is the billionaire Benzina Ivanashvili, who, despite having announced that he was retiring from Georgian politics last month, still very much remains the power behind the throne. Last week, uh, the uh, previous Georgian prime minister, uh, Mr. Gaharia, resigned rather than follow through on what Ivanashvili wanted, which was the arrest of Melia. Um, uh, Ivanashvili then selected uh, uh, Iraqli Garibashvili, who had been prime minister uh, earlier in, in the decade. Um, and Garibashvili is very much a Ivanashvili puppet. And so Garibashvili will do whatever Ivanashvili wants him to. And Garibashvili made it clear when he was uh, chosen to come back as prime minister. Uh, his views about the opposition, which he views as the enemy and, and traitors and criminals. Um, so there, it was not a surprise once he was selected that they went ahead with the arrest of, of Melia. Um, but it, it, it has deeply damaged Georgia's image and reputation and its aspirations for joining Euro-Atlantic institutions. Um, and it is also uh, uh, creating a, a huge challenge in its relationship with the West. Um, the only ones who are smiling about the current situation in Georgia are sitting in Moscow or in presidential palaces and other parts of Russia. Um, so the, the situation in Georgia is very severe, very serious. And um, there, I, I hope that the international community, that the United States, which has sizable influence on the situation in Georgia will take a tough line on Georgian dream. I actually think if Mr. Amelia is not released, then the United States, ideally with the European Union, but the United States on its own, if need be, would move ahead with sanctions, targeted sanctions against individuals in Georgia, starting with Mr. Ivanashvili, but also including the prime minister. And actually touching him in the uh, pocketbook would be a significant change in what he's been able to do in growing his own um, wealth. Do Absolutely. You see, do you see um, Russian puppet strings in there anywhere or is are they pretty much hidden or? Uh, I, I would say, you know, the relations with Russia since Georgian Dream came to power and that was through elections in 2012 um, for uh, the the parliament and then 2013 for the president, um, relations with Russia have slowly been improving. That has not been a particularly popular move, but it's also a reflection of frustration among the population and even Georgian leadership with the lack of progress um, toward EU membership and toward NATO membership. And so the feeling among some politicians in Georgian dream is, well, Russia's always going to border us, so we may as well try to make the best of that relationship. And um, in this current crisis, I'm not sure that Russia is really pulling the strings. This, this may be much more of an indigenous problem. Um, now, it may lead to some reaction in Moscow, um, either arguing that um, a Georgian dream is in the right, it's handling this properly. Again, it'll be interesting to see if they take the same approach of, of arguing that no one should meddle in Georgian internal affairs as it has staked out on the issue of Armenia. But um, I, I do think that it, 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 is, it is much more of a Georgian issue. Um, and and it's, it's reflective of a deeply polarized Georgian politics. And it also boils down to two outsized personalities, uh, Benzina Ivanashvili on the Georgian dream side, and then former president and former head of the UNM party, uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, who's uh, been in Ukraine for, for the past several years. Um, even though he's not in Georgia, Saakashvili still wields quite a bit of influence over UNM, in fact, is arguably the most influential person. And Melia was quite close to him. 
uh, Vashadze, who had been the leader of UNM uh, before, uh, seemed to be a bit more of an independent player and, and more moderate in tone. But when he stepped down, uh, Nelia took over. Um, that was an indication that UNM was staking out a, a more uh, strident position. And, and it also goes back to events in, and this is where Russia did have a role in June 2019, when um, as part of an orthodox uh, movement, uh, Sergei Gavrilov, a member of the Russian Duma, was invited to Tbilisi, a member of the Communist Party, um, spoke in the parliament from the speaker's chair, and that caused a huge uproar. And that's where a lot of this originated, because Melia then called during demonstrations against that, which, by the way, cost uh, Kobakitsa, the then Speaker of the Parliament, his position, he had to resign. Uh, Melia uh, advocated for storming the Parliament, and that's where he was brought up on charges. Um, and, and so Russia did have a role to play of, of making trouble uh, in that situation. But um, uh, and then the elections of last fall kind of made, made the situation even worse, where the opposition didn't recognize the results, claimed they were fraudulent, and um, uh, and, and have, have refused to take their seats in the parliament. So that's all, that that part is all Georgian. Uh, but Russia did play a role back in 2019 in, in uh, stirring things up a bit. So in the even though that one is the Georgia situation may be really centered on domestic politics, in the broadest sense, aren't all of these unsettlings in the Caucasus um, an example of the West against Russia? They are to a degree. Um, I, I, I guess I would agree with that more if the West were more engaged. Um, and part of the problem, I think, has been lack of engagement um, from the West. Uh, I mentioned at the start that uh, there were two visits to Georgia uh, by Vice President Pence and Secretary Pompeo, no visits to Armenia or Azerbaijan. Um, the West was not a player in the latest fighting. Uh, the Minsk group was virtually uh, non-existent as a player um, at last fall. And so it would be more perhaps of a Russia-West competition if the West were actually a player in that competition. Um, Russia is much more influential. It, 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 it's obviously closer. Um, but I do think the West needs to get more involved because there's a lot at stake at this region. Um, the, the, the West, I think, has largely washed its hands of the human rights situation in Azerbaijan, where um, it, it seems much more interested in the energy and economic potential of Azerbaijan than it is with the pretty ugly human rights situation there. In Armenia, there was some excitement on the part of the West after Pashinyan came to power, but uh, not a sustained movement. The, the, Georgia, Georgia has been the darling uh, in the region. I mean, Georgia has often been described as this island of democracy in a sea of authoritarianism and that changed a little bit with armenia um, but um, now georgia is almost sinking into this authoritarian sea depending on what happens and how that plays out so um, russia does not want to see these countries move closer toward the euro atlantic community and it doesn't particularly want uh, major instability in these countries because of concern that there may be some spillover effects. Um, but I think if, if these countries are kind of viewed as uh, slight basket cases that the West will lose interest in, and if they uh, grow in their dependence on Russia for security and other things, um, that I think will, will serve Mr. Putin's interests. He, he views these countries, he barely views them as independent states. Um, he views them as part of the near abroad, the term that they use, I don't like, uh, but the near abroad in, in part of Russia's uh, sphere of influence. And uh, and so that that is a reflection of, of how Russia views the region. Um, and our lack of engagement, I would say, um, is an indication that we aren't a major player. So I want to close by saying if you were still advising the president, um, and who knows, maybe you are that we don't know about. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would your advice be about specific strategies? I mean, you talked a little bit about the human rights issues, but what can the U.S. do to be back? 
Well, the the South Caucasus is, uh, is a key part of the Black Sea region, and the Black Sea is a very important region for um, uh, all the countries uh, there, as well as for the United States, in ensuring that there is free navigation and, and, and increasing stability among the states that are a part of the Black Sea region is critically important. Um, there, there are a lot of key countries in this region. Um, there, you have Russia, you have Turkey, you have Iran, uh, Ukraine, as well as, of course, the South Caucasus. Um, you have uh, uh, Bulgaria, Romania. Um, it, it, it's a region of great importance, and so we need to be more engaged in the region. Um, we need to, as and I think, I think the Biden administration will do this. Um, place democracy and human rights issues on a much higher level than they have been in the past. Um, and, and President Biden said that in his Munich remarks, he said it in his remarks at the State Department when he spoke there. So I'm, I'm hopeful that those issues will take on a more prominent profile in dealing with all three countries, um, because we, we can't just view these countries through a Russia prism and ignore the human rights problems. We have to uh, keep in mind Russia and, and its role in the region, but we also need to deal with each country in its own right and recognize that um, there are issues and challenges. We also need to approach it to be clear with a strong dose of humility, uh, given what uh, this country has been through uh, the past few years, and in particular uh, since really November and then, of course, the tragic events of January 6 here where we saw a storming of our parliament building. Um, and, and so I think, um, I, I hope we recognize the importance of each country. I hope we support the people in each country. Sometimes we get so fixated on the leaderships in these countries that we forget and neglect the populations here. And, and there are a lot of people suffering, including uh, those who might be critical of the government. Uh, they tend to pay uh, the biggest price in this. So um, I, I hope we'll see more engagement. Um, I hope we'll see uh, uh, in, in the cases where they need them, new ambassadors or uh, a reaffirmation of the ambassadors who were there. Um, and I hope we recognize that, that uh, uh, while some of these developments are indigenous in nature, um, that Mr. Putin does not mean the region well and that we recognize the threat that he poses to the region and beyond for that matter, um, and, and uh, develop a, a coherent policy that pushes back on, on that Russian aggression and the Russian threat. Thank you, Mr. David J. Kramer. And I appreciate your insights um, and recognition that this is a, on a region in turmoil right now, and it, it is in our best interest to keep our eye on it, and we promise we will. And I hope we can have you back again soon. Pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. I, I